web seminar series. Uh, let me just on. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining today's web seminar series uh, number 11. Uh, it, it was amazing that I, I came to realize that we already gone through more than 10 seminars already. So this is one of the initiatives that I, together with uh, Professor Sangam, um, started. Uh, just let me start. So um, please be informed that this web seminar, uh, as well as the others, um, it is broadcasting live uh, on uh, Facebook of a web web page. Uh, so, but I would, uh, on behalf of the organizers, I would uh, kindly request uh, all participants uh, to help share uh, this uh, live event so that this meaningful knowledge sharing session can be reach out to a larger audience within your professional network. Thank you. Um, so, with that, I would like to take the liberty. Uh, to introduce our presenters today. So um, I would allow, let me allow, allow me to share screen. Okay. So our first presenter today, oh, sorry, is uh, Dr. Dan Trung Eng. So uh, he's a senior lecturer of Water Resources University. Uh, so one of the top university for water research and engineering in Vietnam. Um, so Dr. An got his uh, PhD in Tsukaba uh, University of Japan, um, and his research interests include groundwater flow dynamics, hydrogeochemistry, uh, seawater intrusion, mapping natural hazards, and water quality assessment. Actually, uh, Dr. Dang Trung has been my close collaborators uh, for the last two years, and then we have uh, published several papers together. So uh, it was my real honor to invite Dr. An today to, to share his knowledge with us. So coming to today's uh, seminar, uh, Dr. An will share with us uh, his research on groundwater flow system and hydrogeochemical processes in coastal aquifers of the Mekong Delta, uh, the third world's largest uh, delta uh, in the world. Uh, following up, uh, we will have uh, the presentation from one of our alumni, uh, Mr. Miyuru Bandara. Uh, so Mr. Miyuru is no stranger to all of us. Actually, we have met several times. And Mr. Miyuru's research interests include hydrological modeling, climate change adaptation, analysis of climate. Um, coming to today's uh, web seminar, uh, Mr. Miyuru will share with us his research on evaluation of ecosystem-based adaptation measures for sediment yield in a tropical watershed in Thailand. Actually, the term ecosystem-based adaptations or better known as EBA, or nature-based solutions have been emerging as one of the third top uh, research keywords. So I myself am very excited uh, to hear the sharing of Mr. Miyuru. Um, so uh, with that, uh, without any further ado, uh, I would like to um, uh, invite uh, Mr. Dr. Ang to share his screen first. Uh, so that uh, we can start today's seminar. Uh, thank you, everyone. Okay. Good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lok, for a very kind introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to join today's webinar focusing on the groundwater flow dynamic and hydrogeochemical processes in Kota Africa of the Mekong Delta. Um, can you hear me clearly? Yes, Dr. Oh. I. We, we, yes, Dr. I. We can hear you. Right, yeah. Okay. So maybe you want to change your cursor into a pointer uh, so that it would be easier for us to follow uh, the slide. Okay. Let Let me. Yeah. You can right click and change it to pointer. Okay. Let, let, let. Okay, maybe 
Here is clearly, right? Uh, yes, you can right click on the cursor and change it to the pointer. You can right click on right your click. mouse. Okay, okay. On your mouse right. and change. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Pointer. Right. Okay. Yeah, laser pointer. Laser pointer, okay. the first one. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You're good. Laser pointer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Today, to week, it, I'd like to setting with some research outcome. Uh, based on groundwater flow dynamic and hydrogel chemical processes in the coastal aquifer of the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. Uh, yeah, this is a very uh, exciting topic. Uh, and I will share you very important key findings from our research project. Yeah, let's start with introduction. Uh, and we all know that the Mekong Delta is located in the downstream of the Mekong River Basin. It means that every every activity from upstream and middle of the Mekong River Basin will indirect on direct impact on groundwater flow system in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. Uh, as you can see that in this uh, in the upstream part, very high density uh, hydropower plant development may influence on the annual and in follow system into the Mekong Delta. And it will be changed the groundwater flow uh, recharge into the uh, coastal aquifer. In the Mekong Delta, we have very uh, intensive groundwater attraction for irrigation, for a household, for industrial development. And also because of climate change and sea level rise, seawater intrusion more. Uh, impact on the coastal aquifer, especially along with the depletion of groundwater level. So the question here is, the how groundwater flow system change under human and also natural variation? And how can we understand the hydrogeochemical processes under this pressure? This is a very big question because in most of coastal area, we use most only groundwater for water supply system. Because why? Because the river water now more salinity and we cannot use the subic water for water treatment plant or water supply in this area. So we do sustainable groundwater management and efficiently uh, use of groundwater in this region. We would like to understand how groundwater flow system change under the dynamics of the human activity and uh, climate variation, and how the water quality change under this pressure. So there are many research have been done. Oh, sorry, I have to change. Okay. There are many research focusing on groundwater flow dynamic and geochemical processes in coastal area over the world and also in the coastal lowland area. And most of them, because focusing on the groundwater flow charts, hydrogeology, hydrology, seasonal variation, and also the some minor dissolution process uh, influencing on the groundwater quality in coastal area. But the other gap here is how the groundwater flow system change and how the groundwater quality were influenced by the human activity and climate variation, especially the sea level rise. That's why this is focusing on the make clear groundwater flow system and groundwater quality change under uh, in combination with the human activity and climate variation. This research uh, objective is focusing on the investigate groundwater flow dynamic, including the groundwater level variation flow direction in coastal multi aquifer in the impact of uh, intensive groundwater extraction and uh, influenced by tidal fluctuation. And we also try to explore or make clear groundwater origins and estimate the contribution ratio 
uh, of the potential recharge short to shallow and deep groundwater. And also we identify the hydrogel chemical characteristic, especially the mineral dissolution, precipitation, seawater intrusion in coastal area. And with the main controlling factor influencing the groundwater flow dynamic and also groundwater quality. So the research originally focusing on the new and fruitful chemical and stable isotope data of surface water and groundwater in coastal Lao land tropical delta in the Mekong, in Vietnam. And also we try to uh, explaining the spectral uh, distribution of salinity and stable isotope, and also to quantify the evaporation and seawater intrusion into the coastal aquifer. And we provide uh, insight uh, into the vertical uh, salinization process from the shallow to deeper aquifer. And after that, we provide a better understanding on the groundwater flow system in this region. Here is follow that uh, methods. We thought uh, we will do analysis uh, by using a literary view and we go to the future way uh, to uh, do the sampling and we installing the uh, monitoring system. And after that, we analyze the stable isotope uh, some a dating. A dating mean we try to make clear how out of the groundwater and surface water in this region. This is very important information uh, to understand the groundwater follow system and also the recharge mechanism. We also analyze more than 700 samples of water chemistry uh, to explore the how water quality change in under impact of intensive groundwater extraction. And after that, we use the uh, multivariate analysis, just federal analysis. Uh, of course, we apply the machine learning and groundwater modeling to uh, explore the groundwater flow dynamic and hydrogeochemical processes. Here, we have some case study in more detail. This is we consider one of the most uh, important area in the Mekong Delta in Sok Chang province. Uh, this figure shows the location of the Mekong Delta and location of study area. And uh, here in the right hand side, we see the cross section that's showing the characteristic of hydro -ge geological a profile of this area. And here we would like to show some main results focusing on the groundwater for the dynamic. Uh, this is showing the groundwater level in dry season and in rainy season. And you can see that uh, in dry season, groundwater level depletion is uh, very significant. Um, in the central part, uh, groundwater level uh, going down around minus uh, 12 in maximum. But in, in rainy season, you can see that groundwater level seem to be increased. Uh, this is uh, explore, explained by the reducing groundwater extraction in rainy season and also increase the recharge mechanism. And as you can see that uh, here in right hand side, we have the groundwater uh, extraction capacity. And we can see that, we can see clearly that the groundwater extraction in central part has one of the most important uh, factor that's influencing on the groundwater uh, depletion in this area. And also we have observed tidalism how tidal mechanism or fluctuation influence on the groundwater level in this area. We are uh, monitor in two well along the river. And you can see that the, the tidal pattern fluctuation is seem to be, uh, have the, the similar uh, pattern with groundwater level. It means that tidal fluctuation have 
uh, influence on the groundwater level, but the time lag around four and a half hour, uh, depending on location of Bohu. And if we go into the inland, we can see that uh, groundwater level may not strongly influenced by the tidal region, but going to the close to the, the coastal area, we could see that the boho one in the along the coast more flown by the uh, tidal fluctuation. And in addition to the groundwater follow dynamic, we also analyze the geochemistry in both rainy and dry season. And in general, the groundwater chemistry in this region uh, have no significant difference between dry and rainy season. But in beyond this bio, bio, bio diagram, we could see uh, some very uh, in more detail uh, project here is, we could see the red line that showing the uh, shallow groundwater may be influenced by the seawater intrusion. There are some deep groundwater may influenced by the minor rodeo because of increase the carbonate and sodium. That is very important because beyond that, we could understand how groundwater quality change because of seasonal variation because of the uh, groundwater attraction. And the main trend here is we have unclear seasonal variation in chemistry, indicating that this groundwater quality not change so much because of natural variation. That is very important part. And second is various, uh, very different uh, water type. It means that groundwater in this region had experience in different geochemical processes, including uh, salinization, uh, changing from the uh, calcite biocarbonate water type to the sodium chloride uh, water type. Very important because this showing that groundwater in this location more or high vulnerability because of the salinization process. And another process is rock and water interaction. It's changing from the uh, Cassite biocarbonate to sodium rich uh, biocarbonate, meaning that more groundwater have been experienced into freshing uh, process. Freshing means more recharge from upstream may uh, washing the salinity contained in groundwater in deep aquifer in this region, make groundwater in this location at deeper aquifer more of fresh fresher um did it very few to suitable for a uh, water supply and we also analyze stable isotope uh data between dry and rainy season to understand the uh recharge me mechanism and origins of raw water here looking at the figure showing that Groundwater in this location has strongly influenced by evaporation process because this is showing. Uh, okay, I will I will make the here here we can see this is the local uh, material water line mean that this is standard uh, water line, and here this is our sample showing that. Uh, Surface water and groundwater in this location strongly influenced by evaporation process. And some groundwater uh, distribute close to the sea, mean that groundwater in this location has uh, strongly influenced by the seawater intrusion process. Uh, okay, let's see. Next, we also in the uh, make interpretation with other data in over the Asian country along the coast, including the data from Thailand, including data from uh, uh, Bangladesh, 
from uh, uh, our country and also from uh, Manila, Philippines. And this showing the trend of groundwater origins in this location, including the fishing which water experience into the evaporation and intensive uh, recharge by rainfall. That is very important uh, figure showing the origin of groundwater in this location, mainly recharged by rainfall. And after that, experience into the evaporation project. And next, we also compare with the daily rainfall and showing that the, the rainfall in this location is main water, groundwater recharge in this location. And the rainfall showing the very high variation in uh, stable isotope and also the, uh, the rainfall intensity. And we see that uh, in this location, main recharge from upper part of the Ho Chi Minh city and also from upper part of the Cambodia, uh, main recharge shot into the Mekong Delta based on this uh, information. And this figure also show the distribution of stable isotope and, and chloride showing the mechanism of seawater intrusion and also groundwater origin in this location. And we can see that here, uh, the shallow and deep, deep groundwater is very different in stable isotope. You can see here. In this here is shallow groundwater. Here is deeper aquifer and deeper aquifer. And groundwater in this location in shallow aquifer seem to be very heavy in stable isotope, meaning that this may influence by the seawater intrusion. But in the deeper aquifer, the stable isotope and chlor chloride concentration uh, did it low, below 1,000 milligram per liter, meaning that this deep groundwater had experienced in parallel seawater intrusion for a long time ago, maybe thousands of years ago. Or based on our data of groundwater A dating, we see that the Groundwater in deep aquifer around maximum around 45,000 years ago was recharged by rainfall. And they experienced into the, some process of uh, seawater intrusion for a long time ago. Now they experience, continue to experience into pressing aquifer, mean more water recharge from up team, pushing into the coastal area and go to the ocean. So now, the salinity in deeper aquifer seem to be decreasing because of recharge process and freshing uh, mechanism. And next, I'd like to continue with some very interesting uh, figure showing how the seawater intrusion, how the evaporation process and recharge may influence on the the characteristic of the salinity and also stable isotope in this location. And as you can see here, more groundwater in shallow aquifer distribute along the sea water sample. It means that this groundwater had experienced into the seawater intrusion in a modern time, below 100 years ago. This is very important information. So this information showing that if we continue exploit the shallow groundwater may make or resulting in the more modern seawater intrusion in the shallow water aquifer. That is very important. And next, we also saw the some process of salinization process in water aquifer. And we classify in two groups. One is group with very high salinity compared to water supply standard. Chloride concentration in uh, uh, work, a global um, health department mentioned that the in water, uh, drinking water supply for chloride, not higher than 100, uh, 250 milligram per liter. And here 
we saw that our groundwater sample here very high chloride concentration. Even some sample around 17 gram per liter. It means that very high and cannot be due anymore for water supply system. But there are some deeper aquifer. You can see that in gray color. Some deeper aquifer have lower in chloride concentration, but some still high. Some deeper aquifer with high salinity, meaning that there are some project of seawater intrusion, not only direct from the sea, but also maybe leaching from shallow to deeper aquifer because of groundwater exploitation. That is very important information that I would like to share with you. And sorry, here we also uh, make cross session with 3D visualization uh, of chloride and stable isotope. We can see that because of high groundwater extraction in in central part of the study area, more the saline shallow groundwater have influenced into the deeper aquifer. And you can see here in the vertical, higher salinity from shallow aquifer may influence into the deeper aquifer. This is very uh, good evidence to showing the influence of groundwater extraction in this area, resulting in the more seawater intrusion into the deeper aquifer because of leaching saline from uh, upper layer to the lower layer. And we here showing the one cross section here. And we can see that this is the groundwater level, this is the, the trend of groundwater uh, going down into this area. And we can see that in shallow aquifer, very high chloride concentration, it means that very high salinity will influence on the deeper aquifer because of the in deeper aquifer, more groundwater level depletion has been occurred in it. And because of changing the gradient between the upper part to lower part, more salinity from shallow will influence or will moving down to the deeper aquifer. And you can see here, some deeper aquifer have seemed to be increased in chloride concentration or salinity concentration. It is very good evidence beyond our research. This, we conclude that because of aquifer interconnection, vertical groundwater follow had been occur and transferring more salinity from the shallow to deeper aquifer. This is very important and the government should pay more attention on prevention of groundwater extraction in deep aquifer. Yeah. And also beyond our research, we also calculate the how much percent of the seawater intrusion it contribute to uh, water shot in, in, in this study area. And here showing the how the river uh, and groundwater uh, sample change in stable isotope. This very significant indicator to calculate the water contribution into the uh, shallow and deeper aquifer. And based on this result, we calculate the contribution ratio using the mixed end member missing analysis. And we saw two models. One is shallow groundwater, how shallow groundwater uh, uh, was influenced by the uh, seawater intrusion, influenced by the river and, 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 and rainfall recharge. And how deeper aquifer may influence by this kind of project. Here, I showing shallow groundwater with three end member and end member mixing analysis. And we can see that there are some groundwater have very uh, strongly influenced by the seawater intrusion. Gray color showing seawater intrusion contribution. And ranging around, how much here? You can see, uh, around 1%, uh, sorry, 
the minimum around 15% to 100%. Some groundwater, shallow groundwater, had strongly and mainly contribute by seawater, 100%. But some may be below 15%. And some, even some very close sample along the coastal area, uh, no mixing with seawater. It's very surprising uh, the result. But we, we will explain more detail here. Because of the shallow groundwater close to the river, and the river has uh, infiltrated into the shallow groundwater. They have to contribute around, around um, we have the, around the maximum 100% contribution by rainfall and river water. And another process is evaporation water from a pond, from the canal, and also from river will contribute for groundwater in this location. Moving to the deeper aquifer. Oh, sorry. In deeper aquifer, we have three end members, rainfall, evaporation, recharge source, and bracket water. And we can see here that seawater intrusion also influence on the deeper aquifer ranging from 5% uh, to 100%. And evaporated water uh, from the river, from the pond, also contribute significantly onto the uh, ground, deep groundwater. And seawater also, and rainfall. Rainfall ranging from uh, more than half of uh, contribution ratio between three and member. It means that rainfall is major contribution uh, recharge short to deeper aquifer in this location. Based on the, this kind of information, we also uh, try to understand how the pumping activity influence on the groundwater flow system in this location. And we make the simulation by using groundwater model and uh, with different scenario. We have the six scenario, including scenario one, two, three, four, five, six, with the changing the groundwater exchange ratio and the changing water level. And we can see that with a scenario two, uh, did it very um, like a very significant uh, scenario showing that if we increase 5%, groundwater accession per year, which continue groundwater follow system in, uh, decreasing around 12.5 meter per meter. We expected that in 2030, groundwater follow system in this location will have significant uh, depletion in groundwater level, uh, reaching to uh, minus, let's see, minus 25 meter underground surface. And also we uh, simulate the seawater intrusion uh, with different scenario and how the seawater intrusion uh, may influence on the groundwater quality in the location. We can see that with scenario three, uh, more groundwater seawater intrusion into the deeper aquifer around uh, 200 meter below uh, grass surface. Yeah, and reaching around uh, maximum around two or three gram per liter. Sorry. Okay, so uh, maybe I over time. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, I will I will so very important summarize groundwater flow system in the Mekong Delta. Here we can see that rainfall is the main recharge shot to both shallow and deep groundwater in the Mekong Delta, and also evaporated water like from the river, from pond, and lake may also contribute to the groundwater in this location. 
And the third shot is mixing with uh, origin seawater from sea, direct from ocean, or even salinity from river may recharge into the mixing with shallow and deep aquifer. And um, intensive pumping activity has strongly influenced on the groundwater flow system in this location. And changing from fresh water to a practice water because of the salinization process, uh, moving down the salinity from shallow to deeper aquifer. That is very important, uh, uh, indicates uh, e evidence to uh, raising the uh, pay more attention on the sustainable groundwater management in this location here is we have to uh, changing the pumping uh, pattern and maybe uh, we will use more groundwater in dry season, but in rainy season we use alternative uh, water supplies, uh, river water and other water uh, to reducing high pressure on coastal aquifer. Yeah, um, okay. Uh, this is some main finding. Maybe I will share this uh, presentation for you. Uh, and also, uh, you could access some our paper to read more information about the, our finding. Uh, I, I show here. So, uh, okay, thank you very much for guy attending today. Uh, I uh, would be very happy to receive any any comment, any uh, discussion on it. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Ang, for such an informative uh, presentation. Actually, I think this is, um, I, I don't know, I think you can have multiple PhDs <laughs> with this kind of information as well. So uh, thank you very much for, for sharing all of this valuable information with us today. Uh, so with that, I would like to open the floor. Uh, the floor for uh, questions, comments, uh, and uh, from uh, our audience. So any of you, if you have any uh, questions um, or uh, have something to discuss with Dr. Ang, please unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ma Dr. Lok. Yeah. yeah. If, I think if you have any, any question or any discussion, uh, I will welcome and we will make more clear Maybe uh, my presentation very complicated because so many information, so many uh, graphs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, I think yeah, some please. some of our students uh, are working very uh, closely in uh, groundwater in this aquifer. Yeah. Um, I can see that maybe Suradi, you have any questions for uh, Dr. I? I think this is really a good opportunity because since you are using remote sensing, but uh, Dr. I is a very um, you know, intensive field guy. So maybe some information that uh, you can also um, ask for his uh, comments. So Ruby, you um, haven't... Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for this informative presentation. Yes, I'm also doing my study in the same reason. So uh, I find the presentation very informative and I will uh, look into it again later and uh, will ask you some questions if, if needed. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you have any questions at this point, Suravi? At, at this point, I don't have it, sir. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Surab, Surabi. Yeah. So anyone have uh, questions? Please uh, mute yourself and ask questions. Yes. To, uh, can I have some some comments and, and questions? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Tom, Tom. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Firstly, I, I think I could I need to like to thank Dr. An for I think very very informative uh, presentation. So I think Dr. Lok should like a uh, uh, give to Dr. Ahn maybe two hours or even more to send. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I think, uh, yeah, yeah. No. I think 30 minutes is quite very short, yeah. short time. But anyway, we can see that I think a lot of valuable results here can be commend to the, the government. Yeah. So I think not much comment on the technical, but I just want to uh, discuss with Dr. Dr. Ahn. Uh, I think the most important thing here uh, from the research, we can carry out the um, uh, evidence of the interconnection between the aquifer uh, by the some analysis on the, the sample, uh, uh, table atosop and other. So uh, in terms of research, Dr. An have like developed the map to define like the area, like the zone of the 
interconnection between aquifer, I think it's will very useful for the, the government because now uh, a lot of project of the well production during the drought time. So it should be good if we can like uh, uh, provide like uh, the area we can like uh, limit the, the pumping or potential the pumping relevant to the quality as well. Actually, we we uh, in the past I think more concerned about the quantity, but quality here can I think have very valuable results. So have you have you do it uh, before? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Tuan. I think a very good comment and uh, recommendation. Uh, yeah, uh, and we know that uh, in the Mekong Delta, we now try to make clear the, the location or zoning or mapping the area of interaction between the shallow and deep aquifer. That is very important because beyond that, we could uh, delineate or prevent the protect area because some pollution from the surface water may influence a, a deeper aquifer because of the aquifer interconnection. Yeah. So we are now uh, doing more research uh, in the own of the Mekong Delta. It is just only one research in the very specific area in the in the Mekong Delta. So thank you very much, and yeah, I hope so that we would uh, work together. Yes. Not only Dr. Tuan, Dr. Lok, and other our student here, our researcher here, to join our research. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, yeah. I think um, that it will come up with I think very strong confidence with the the the, the map. If we can carry out this job to cover the whole whole Mekong Delta, you can see like uh, the 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 entire of the Delta with the, the pattern and distribution of the interconnected between the, the aquifer is very important because in the Mekong Delta, I think six or seven aquifer defined by confine, but the, the interconnected, it, I think it's view many where, so it affects to the, the, the pumping as well. And I see one signal from the research, like a saline groundwater seem to be decreased in the deep aquifer. So it's also the one point I think, uh, I think I need the time to, to read more in, in the output, uh, output products. Uh, some paper here to, to see, but I think it's like a very good signal uh, to 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 learn from the, like, the coastal area, uh, coastal aquifer. So thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Tuan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ang. I think uh, we have some new students here. I think uh, I really appreciate their participation, even though they are just like taking the coursework. Um, so this is just to assure you that AIT has a very well-rounded research network in the region. So any of you, if you have a good research question and then uh, you want to reach out to our colleagues in Vietnam or in Cambodia, you have can also have a good research network over here can help you out with the, the two effort and everything. So uh, please, uh, you know, uh, take the initiative to, to, uh, to, to do good research. Um, so with that, uh, may I invite uh, Mr. Royal, uh, our uh, photographer uh, to call coordinate the uh, group session photo of everyone. Uh, Royal, uh, may I bother you? Thank you. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. So please turn on your camera for the group photo session. Wait for another. Please turn on your camera. Yeah. And smile. Okay, on your mark. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Okay, I will count. Okay, wait, wait, someone, some people are still. Yeah. Okay, so okay. I will count. One, two, three, smile. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, okay, so uh, with that, uh, thank you again for Dr. Ang for sharing uh, your implementation. Everyone who's interested, uh, so please uh, drop him an email for uh, to for the, the discussion. So with that, I would like to invite our second presenter today, Mr. Miyuru uh, Kunathileki, uh, to start sharing your screen and a second presentation. Thank you. So can you see the screen now? Yes, yes, Miyuru, you can start. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, professors, uh, distinguished researchers, guests, and my dear colleagues. 
So uh, thank you very much for providing me this opportunity, uh, for giving me this platform uh, to uh, give my, uh, to present the research findings uh, of mine. And uh, let me brief about myself first, give me a few seconds. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Locke. I'm Yuru and I graduated from a master's in water engineering program in 2018. And also I'm a bachelor's degree graduate from AIT as well. Uh, so uh, currently I am affiliated as an assistant lecturer at the Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology uh, in Sri Lanka. So uh, before starting this work, uh, I'd like to say that uh, this work is based upon on my uh, master's thesis. Uh, which is ecosystem-based adaptation measures for uh, controlling uh, soil erosion and sediment yield in a watershed of northeastern part of Thailand. So uh, before moving uh, into my uh, presentation, I'd like to uh, give, me, give you all a brief background about how I was involved for this work and what were the initial initiatives. So, uh, in, uh, to, I, I should say, uh, I'll take about one minute to tell how I was involved in this work because it's very important. Uh, this is actually, uh, uh, this was a part of an ongoing project at that time in 2017. So uh, when we completed master's uh, thesis work, uh, Professor Babel uh, said, uh, told me that uh, there's an opportunity for an internship in uh, GIZ where there was an ongoing project called improved management of uh, extreme uh, events through ecosystem-based adaptation in watersheds of Thailand, uh, which was a royal initiative uh, with the collaboration of Royal Irrigation Department with GIZ Project Office uh, of Thailand. So in this, uh, in this work, they were planning to build or they were constructing an irrigation reservoir in uh, Hawaii Tapo, which is located in the uh, northeastern part of Thailand. Uh, the province is called Muktahan. And they wanted to see uh, what is the impact of ecosystem-based adaptation measures for uh, floods and droughts. So actually, floods and droughts are more prevalent in the northeastern part of Thailand. So they wanted to see, the GIZ team and the Royal Irrigation Department consultants, they want to see uh, what is the impact of uh, this, what is the effectiveness of EBAs. Uh, of, on uh, water resources. So although they were doing uh, several studies at that time, most of them were uh, qualitative, but none of them didn't uh, try to address a quantitative aspect. So uh, through an internship, I joined this program as well. And then I was, uh, then uh, we developed, uh, Professor Babel, Dr. Professor Sangam and our team, we developed uh, a topic called uh, ecosystem-based adaptations for soil and water conservation, which is my thesis title. And then uh, we developed a hydrological model, uh, a SWOT model uh, to examine uh, what is the impact of this on uh, soil and water conservation strategies. So this is the background of this work. So this is a funded work uh, where I availed an opportunity for an internship. And uh, so this is, I wanted to share my experience with uh, the students who are currently doing coursework to also tell that uh, AIT is a marvelous place if you want to do research actually. So those, though there are a lot of opportunities uh, in the university itself, especially within our department. So I just want to motivate you when you are working uh, for your research work, uh, maybe this year, maybe next year. So that's why I wanted to give you a small background of how I was involved for this work. And let me move into uh, the specific topic, watershed degradation in Northeastern part of Thailand. So as you know, uh, deforestation, land use changes, unsustainable agricultural management practices are the main reasons for a watershed degradation in many parts of the country, in the world actually, not in, only in the northeast part of Thailand, but these cases are reported many, in many places of the world. Uh, but uh, in the developing region, the, these impacts are very, I mean, very highly negative. I mean, these, they are negatively impacting uh, 
the resources. And uh, in the northeastern part of Thailand, when compared to the other parts, uh, actually the northeastern part of Thailand comprises one sixth, one third of the country's whole land area. So uh, many studies have documented that uh, watershed degradation in this area is comparatively very high, uh, not only because of, uh, and also the soil erosion rates are very high. It's because of uh, the soil erosion rates are because the erod erodibility, the soil erodibility, which we quantify from the K factor is quite high in this region when compared to the other region. So that's an inherit, uh, that's inherited to that soil. But also uh, the, with coupling, when coupling deforestation and uh, this uh, inheritant uh, soil erosion, high uh, soil erodibility of these soils, uh, the soil erosion and the sediment yield of streams and rivers in these regions are quite high. And also, uh, the government initiatives of promoting uh, biofuel such as cassava and sugar cane. Uh, so when uh, the government uh, plans to initiate these kind of cash crops, uh, farmers tend to uh, cut the forests and cultivate uh, cassava and sugar cane, uh, which uh, will definitely uh, result in uh, more amounts of deforestation. And also, uh, there have been many studies uh, which have been documented in Thailand also, the negative impacts of uh, deforestation and watershed degradation. And uh, some of the studies uh, have reported that uh, the biodiversity, the, bio uh, the ecosystem services capacity have decreased significantly uh, because of this reason. And also, uh, the soil erosion, high amount of soil erosion, the uh, sedimentation, has uh, in, has decreased the uh, hydropower. I mean the capacity of uh, storage reservoirs, uh, ultimately resulting in decreased hydropower generation. And uh, interestingly, uh, in the northeastern part of Thailand, uh, I know that most of you know have heard about the Songkran River Basin. So in the Songkran River Basin, majority of the land, uh, the soil erosion rate is about uh, twelve point five tons per hectare per year. And when you compare the global erosion rates, it's about 2.4 uh, tons per hectare per year. So from that small two figures, you can imagine the amount of soil erosion in this region. So this shows, these stats show that there's a strong necessity of studying the soil and water conservation strategies in this part of the country. So that's the main aim of our work and our work is to see what is the efficiency of ecosystem-based adaptation measures of con to control these soil erosion rates. Uh, as Dr. Locke mentioned, ecosystem-based adaptation measures is a very uh, highly cited and a highly uh, searched word. And uh, you must have heard about uh, best management practices, uh, nature-based solutions. So they, these all names are uh, same as ecosystem-based management adaptation measures. Uh, so BMP practices or best management practices in the US, they call this in this term, uh, where are the strategies which are being used to uh, reduce uh, nutrients and sediments in agricultural fields. Uh, so uh, so there is a high, I mean, there's high amount of research going on nowadays with the climate change. So, and also uh, these uh, ecosystem-based adaptation measures, they use ecosystems or biophysical systems to uh, improve the soil and water conservation and to, and to a way forward towards agricultural development. And uh, mainly uh, there are two types of EBS where you can categorize them as structural and non-structural EBS. So I have given them also in this slide, you can go through them. And uh, although, there are a lot of studies which have been documented that EBS are very successful in many parts of the world. Still, these implementation, the implementation of them in the developing regions like uh, Thailand, uh, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia are still hindered. Why is this because? Uh, so this is because uh, the technological constraints, the technical constraints, and also the associated costs and also the, uh, the farmers, the people who are cultivating, I mean, I mean, who are in the field, who do this, uh, they don't, they are reluctant to adapt to these things. However, uh, since the practical monitoring or field monitoring is uh, 
resource intensive and also takes a lot of uh, time. And sometimes it's not uh, practical as well. So uh, the most convenient or most feasible approach now is use of the software modeling tools. So for this study also, we use the soil and water assessment tool, which is being used in many regions of the world. Uh, we call it a SWOT model. So in this study, we used the SWOT model and evaluated the efficiency of these in controlling soil erosion and sediment deal. So the major aim of this work is to build up a hydrological model uh, for Hawaii Bangsai River Basin, which is uh, uh, the main catchment of Hawaii Tapo, which I mentioned before, and to assess the effects of EBS on soil erosion. Uh, and more importantly, we should, uh, the audience and the, uh, the, who will benefit from the recommendations from this study are mainly the river basin managers, the planners, the stakeholders, including farmers. So uh, it's very important to identify who are the uh, target audience of the, I mean, mainly be the results of the study and the government agencies as well. So uh, in Thailand, the irrigation department, the Royal Irrigation Department, the Department of Water Resources, uh, the Land Development Department, uh, they can uh, take these results to incorporate these results in their master plans. So going on, uh, this is the study area. Uh, you can see uh, the study area. I'll take my uh, laser point. So this is in the northeastern part of Thailand. Here, this is the northeastern panel bordering to the Laos. This is in the Laos. This is the Laos side. This is the northeastern part of Thailand. And uh, the Mekong River flows from, so ultimately the Huai Bang Sai. Huai Bang Sai is the, main, the larger river, larger river, larger watershed. It drains into the Mekong River near the Mukhan town, which is located near the border of Laos and Thailand. So this is the, uh, higher, the study area, and this is the specific study area. I told earlier that uh, the oil irrigation department constructed a dam. So the dam location is uh, shown here. I, mean, I am pointing my cursor or the laser point. So in, in green color, you can see the outlet of this dam. So uh, the specific, since we had worked on the GIZ project, we chose specially this uh, small watershed or the sub watershed, which is called the Hawaii Tapo uh, sub watershed. And the larger Hawaii Bangsai watershed, uh, there is a sediment gauging station operated by the Department of Water Resources and also a stream flow gauging station, which is operated by the uh, Royal Irrigation Department. So, when you talk about the uh, characteristics of the study areas, the drainage area of this uh, larger uh, river basin is uh, 1,340 square kilometers, and the annual rainfall is about 1,200 millimeters, where the main rainfall season is the monsoon season, where you get mostly about 80% uh, of the annual rainfall. So the annual rainfall, mostly 80% is delivered in that, in that time period, within about four to five months period. And the Hawaii Tapo sub watershed, the small sub, so small sub watershed has a drainage area of about 50, nearly 50 square kilometers, precisely to be 48 square kilometers. So this is where the uh, dam they constructed in 2007. So moving on, these are the characteristics of uh, Hawaii Bangsai, the major watershed, and Hawaii Tapo, the sub watershed. So if you can see from these uh, uh, figures, the land use of uh, Hawaii Bangsai and Hawaii Tapo is mostly uh, deciduous forests. So it's a quite a hill in uh, the Hawaii Bangsai, if you recall the whole, if you consider the whole watershed, about 60, 65% is covered with forests, which are not disturbed actually. In Hawaii Tapo, uh, it's about 97%. It's about 97%. So this, we can say that a very healthy watershed in terms of uh, forested area. So, uh, and uh, when you talk about the soil types, the soil types, which are mainly loamy sand, according to the USD classification. So I have given uh, all those details through this uh, map. So uh, we use the SWOT model and uh, the main reason, so when we are doing a study, we should choose the correct uh, hydrological or modeling tool because uh, we need to see 
uh, what what is the capacity of that so since we had the aim of uh, we had to know about uh, the simulation capacity of stream flow sediments and ecosystem based adaptation among the various hydrological models available today swat model is the most uh, effective and uh, the most uh, mo uh, the more suitable model for this purpose and uh, the main underlying so the finest level of simulation is a hydrological response unit so this is a semi distributed hydrological model uh, so there are other models in hydrology, you can say that are lump, lump based models, but we use a semi-distributed model. So the finest level of simulation is hydrological HRS, we call it as HRS. So this is the main underlying equation of the uh, SWAT model and the uh, different methods used to uh, calculate uh, potentially the transpiration, surface runoff, per hard Graham's method and the soil conservation service per number. So in the model, it's very important to know uh, how, because we are mostly concentrating on soil erosion and sediment yield, we need to know what is the uh, process of how this being are calculated. I mean, when you're using a model, we should not only rely on the results, but we should have some physical understanding about what's happening inside. So the sediment yield or soil erosion, we can say interchangeably. Uh, we use the modified universal soil loss equation and uh, the transport and sediment model uh, was simulated through deposit and degradation using the Bagnold equation, where the uh, maximum sediment carrying capacity of the stream is a function of the peak velocity. So moving on, these are the data requirements. Uh, we had temperature data, rainfall data, and uh, we used uh, gridded data because uh, we had to do uh, the simulation for a long-term run about uh, 30 years. So we had to get data from the Aphrodite data sources. And we had to get uh, observed stream flow and sustainable sediment data to calibrate the model. So, and also the DEM, the digital elevation model, the soil cover and the land use data from uh, different government agencies from Thailand and the Department of Thailand or Irrigation Department. Department of Water Resources and Land Development Department of Thailand. So these are the uh, agencies which we have uh, data to develop this hydrological model. So the methodology is given through this. Firstly, we carried out data collection and develop the hydrological model. And uh, then we chose a hypothetical degraded uh, watershed scenario and then we applied the ecosystem-based adaptation for this because as you see from the slides, the land cover of Huai Tapo is uh, dominated by uh, forests, about 97% forest. So at the present age, as the present age, uh, we don't need to apply EBAs because it's a very healthy watershed. So how are we going to uh, see the effectiveness of EBA? So what we did was we hypothetically degraded this watershed and then apply the EBS and check the efficiency of these. So that's how we did this study. I think you can get, uh, you can see, I can, you can understand from this uh, small flow chart. It's a very simple one. So the first step for any study, what we do, if we do develop a hydrological model is to calibrate the SWOT model. Uh, so uh, we had to identify what were the most sensitive parameters first. So we use this automated tool called SWOT cup identify what are the most sensitive parameters. So uh, I, we changed uh, the, uh, we changed these uh, parameters uh, within the defined ranges and keeping the physical, uh, I mean, we, we can change parameters of a model, but within a, within a range where the, uh, the real processes are being uh, replicated in the model as well. Following up the guidelines, we calibrated uh, the SWOT model and also for flow and for sediment as well. So these are the results of the sediment and flow of uh, fitted values. And these are the results of uh, calibration for stream flow and calibration for sediments, this is suspended sediments. And uh, you can see that from the uh, two statistical indicators which we used were the Nash cliff efficiency and the R squared correlation of coefficient for both evaluating the rainfall for, for runoff and the suspended sediment yield, and they yield very good results. Uh, and uh, according to uh, the SWOT model guidelines, uh, the uh, hydrological model evaluation guidelines of Morai C, uh, these were deemed to be very good. 
So uh, we can conclude that uh, our hydrological model performed very well for the Huai Bangsai uh, River Basin. Uh, and I want to say one thing, uh, one important thing is that I will move back to the slide. So you can see that uh, since our specific watershed which we are focusing is the Huai uh, Tapo, the Huai Tapo. And you can see there's no observed flow data. So what we did was we developed the SWAT model for the whole river basin. And then we kept an outlet at this point. So we can see what is the flow, flow and the, what is the sediments at this point. And we calibrated the whole catch, whole watershed and transferred the same parameters uh, to this watershed as well. So that was the approach what we did here in, my, in our study. And you can see, uh, since uh, the uh, land use is dominated by forest, we consider we can conceptualize it as a healthy watershed. So, uh, under current conditions, as I mentioned before, uh, there's no need of applying any EBS. So, we hypothetically degraded this watershed uh, by introducing the commonly grown, grown crops in this region, which are rubber, sugarcane, and cassava. So, reviewing through literature. Uh, we, I found uh, what are the uh, most appropriate or most suitable soil textures so slopes and soil depths for different crops. Oh. And then, and then uh, I developed uh, the uh, watershed degradation scenarios, seven watershed degradation scenarios. And uh, these are them. So uh, first three, LUS1, LUS2, and LUS3. Uh, these are only individual uh, land use uh, types introduced. And then after that, we had a combined uh, three, another four combined scenarios. And in the table, you can find in the right, the amount of uh, land, I mean, the percentage uh, land use and the land use area of uh, different uh, uh, land use types for a respective scenario. And uh, what we did, we selected uh, several uh, EBAs, then they were filter strips, uh, reforestation, uh, contouring, terracing, and also the combined impact. So uh, we, we found that from literature that filter strips are more effective uh, in slopes which are less than 10%. So we only, uh, so specifically uh, from here, the, uh, from these scenarios, we found uh, what was the uh, most degraded watershed scenario, which was LU7. I can show the soil erosion in that uh, case. And then for that case, we applied the EBS. So the applied EBS were these, uh, the reforestation filter strips, the contouring, we found from literature that they are more effective in slopes, which are less than 10%. The terracing application, also effective in slopes, land areas which are less than 10% and also the combined impacts of them. And in the model, more importantly, we should understand how these are being represented. And in this table, you can see uh, how uh, I represented them in the model. So here you can see uh, due to different land exchange scenarios, I have put mm -hmm. the, soil, the soil erosion in different uh, uh, sub basins in Hawaii Tapo. So, the 50 square kilometer catchment has automatically delineated into 25 sub catchments, sub basins. So here you can see what is the soil erosion severity. So that was a classification I have given here. So from that, I have provided what are the most uh, highly eroded sub basins and what are the basically eroded sub basins. Uh, so you can see for each uh, scenario, land use change scenario, what is the simulated sediment yield? What is the outflux at the outlet and the deposition? So that means deposition is how much sediment is being deposited inside the catchment without flowing out, without going through the outlet. So from here, it was it is very clear that the highest amount of uh, sediment yield or soil erosion was being produced through LUS7, which has 21% of forest, 14% of rubber, 42% of cassava. 23% of sugar cane and the soil erosion rate here is uh, the 13.5 tons per hectare per year. So this is the worst scenario. Uh, so if you can remember the in northeastern Thailand of uh, Songkran River Basin, the soil erosion rate is about 12.5 tons per hectare per year. And if this land use comes in the 
this land use comes i mean happens in the white tapo so this is the amount of soil erosion so you can imagine how much of soil is eroded and how much of negative impacts will it be to the ecosystem and to the environment so from these probable scenarios we chose lus7 to see what is the impact of uh, eba so considering that fact we applied uh, the previously mentioned uh, ebas individual and combination of different ebas and you can see similar to the previous figure what are the uh, in different each sub basin what is the soil erosion severity so you can see from here so from here uh, i calculated what is the reduction of sediment yield when compared to the eba s not that means uh, the worst worst watershed scenario so what we got was that uh, the, uh, the eba combination with reforestation filter strips and grass waterways was the most effective with reducing nearly 88 percent in the river basin so that's the most effective uh, that's a very important finding from our study of from our modeling study so that was the most uh, effective uh, eba combination and uh, we also uh, check what are the annual water balances under uh, different eba scenarios so mostly uh, what we got was through uh, this ebs does not affect uh, these uh, grass i mean uh, filter strips they only have an impact on uh, the uh, the filter strips the reducing filter strips only has an impact on sediment yield but it does not uh, uh, does not have any impact on surface flow so those algorithms in the model have not been modified for uh, surface flow but only for the retainment of sediment yield so you the water balance components Uh, from uh, the baseline scenario to uh, filter strip you can see that's, uh, that the surface runoff still remains the same but has some impacts on uh, other components slightly but when you are going to uh, reforestation uh, the when you are going to reforestation the uh, land uh, the land under uh, forest cover has increased so the evapotranspiration also has been increased which is very natural because Uh, when there are a lot of leaves uh, evapotranspiration is very high so so these results are been validated through uh, natural i mean we can compare it with the natural case as well natural physical cases as well uh, depend so i have given the water balances where water balance components under different scenarios which can be simulated through the sort model in conclusion Uh, we can say that uh, the eba measures could reverse the process of land degradation so if some area is under a land degradation uh, these eba measures can can uh, reverse this impacts and restore it back to its uh, original healthy conditions and we can conclude that uh, these programs if they are implementing watershed restoration programs they should uh, use the combined eba scenarios comprising of reforestation filter strips and grass waterways which were deemed to be very effective uh, from these results so someone can continue they can uh, continue to do a cost benefit analysis because we have not done that in our study so this is a research gap for future research so cost benefit analysis can be done for current climate and the future climate. climate and the references i have used and uh, i would like to uh, kindly uh, remember uh, and uh, kindly thank uh, professor babel who was the supervisor who is the supervisor of this work uh, so professor babel we should mention uh, the guidance he gave and professor sankam shrestha who also was in the committee and gave very in useful insight and professor manoj ja from the north kerala state university so uh, in short model development and uh, in research paper writing professor manoj gave me a very good, gave us a very high contribution mr roland from the giz team where the, he was the project manager and dr duk uh, who was also he's also from vietnam and he was in my research committee and the staff 
of the project uh, improved management of extreme events to ecosystem based adaptation watersheds dr pasu from that project and the all data uh, data agencies uh, the royal irrigation department the department of waterways and metallurgical department and the land development department for their uh, contribution to this work and providing data free of charge uh, and uh, i am happy to announce that uh, this paper got uh, accepted in uh, the journal water by mpdi on last week and we are waiting uh, until it's been published online so this is the paper acceptance certificate from that so if anyone is keen and interested in uh, studying more we have although i haven't presented uh, some some results i mean there were we have discussed it very thoroughly through the paper but due to lack of time i didn't include each and everything in this presentation so if you if you if you if you are keen to learn about this uh, work you can access through this open access journal water which will be available very soon online available very soon where you can learn more about this work and uh, thank you very much uh, for your patience and uh, listening to my work thank you very much uh thank you mr yuru uh, to give a very i would say innovative um way of doing the the modeling actually i'm very excited to 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 look at uh, how you develop the scenarios and stuff um actually two of my uh, students uh, mr mr dam and uh, mr fahad over here are also working closely in the topic um so i think they have learned quite a bit from from your presentation so thank you to me yuru so uh, with that um may i invite uh, the audience uh, if anything anyone have questions please unmute yourself and uh, ask questions uh, directly uh, to uh, mr miyuru uh, i think the uh, time is uh, short so i think we have we can accommodate one question anyone have question uh, please unmute yourself and ask question to mr miyuru thank you hello everyone have question Okay, um, so um, if not, then I think I will take the liberty to ask only one single question, a simple question to Mr. Miguru, since EBA is also the thing that I'm doing. Um, so my simple question is like, when you develop the uh, scenario for the EBA, uh, have you read the policies from the government to come up with this uh, percentage, or it's just a, um, a random things that you want to see the uh, linear improvement? So yes, the uh, thing is uh, from uh, from Thailand they haven't uh, i mean they don't have any proper legislation about like how how much uh, land cover should be like that in that area so what yeah. we did was uh, we don't have any legislation for Thailand actually yeah so <laughs> maybe that's yeah, different I think so too <laughs> I think so that's, too yeah it's in america and canada and developed countries i mean in the europe they have like they yeah. have limited certain percentage that should not be pristine that should be pristine for us but the thing is in the developing region the governments don't because of the economical condition so they are trying no, to yeah yeah so because actually of actually my my question is like if you read any like a social economic development plans you see in that your know, particular sub basin that some companies have already planned to kind of develop or you know transform this forest into something else yes. and then because you want to look at the um you know the performance of um um EBA uh, in a hypothetical scenario Synonyms. and then you you are doing something like a reverse engineer to reverse. Have, yes it's a reverse engineer so um kind of like hypothetical a more adverse condition if i understand correctly right yes, so sir, if if there is one company or if there is a news that i say they want to convert this certain amount of a percentage into uh, something else and then uh, that that will actually uh, make the case for your research even stronger because hey I any mean, if you convert this way mm -hmm. uh, this is the expected output uh, to to look at yes okay sir. yeah okay so uh, with that uh, thank you mr miyuru uh, it's been um, a long um, event for everyone but uh, i believe that everyone have learned a lot from dr an and uh, mr miyuru uh, so uh, with that I'm happy to, uh, if there's anything students so please tell them with the paper will be published very soon so they can also i i can send you the email to you but the uh, uh, thing is i can also help your students if there's anyone who is interested in this work yes definitely i think at least two of my students are working directly in the topic of nds and eba i think uh, they already defended the proposal sure. but uh, i mean they will keep you posted on the progress 
So uh, with that, I would like to wrap up uh, today's seminar series, web seminar series number 11. Thank you, everyone. And to those of you who will have uh, exam this week, uh, all the best. And uh, we will uh, meet each other uh, exactly one month from now. Uh, it will be on the uh, 3rd of November. So uh, do look out for our next uh, announcement. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you.